So, yeah, thanks very much for inviting us along. And we're just going to share with you the project that we've been working on. So NHS Lothian, the trust that we work for, or the board that we work for, is one of the 14 um, health boards across Scotland. And we were successful in September, uh, sorry, early 2019 in securing funding from the Scottish government. So the Scottish government had um, offered funding to organisations that wanted to support breastfeeding. So these projects had to align with the Scottish government's um, stretching which is, it's quite long-winded, but I'm going to go for it. So the stretch aim from the Scottish Government is to reduce um, the drop-off in breastfeeding at the six to eight week check by 10% by 2025. So that's one of their aims in relation to breastfeeding. So we submitted applications um, for two projects and we were successful in, in securing funding for both of those. The first project was for um, antenatal hand expressing and um, a colleague worked on that one. And the second project that we got funding for is the one that we're going to talk about this evening. And as Sue kindly introduced, it's the Delivering Early Breastfeeding Support, DEBS for short project, and that was born in September 2019. So the idea in this project is to have a multi-skilled team who um, cut across maternity and health visiting services to mobilise um, support for breastfeeding, early support for breastfeeding. Now, unfortunately, due to issues with recruitment, the multi-skilled team is Caroline and I, basically. The, um, they were unsuccessful in recruiting to the other um, vacancies that we had, which would have been nursery nurses and maternity care assistants. So Caroline and I are the, the, the team as it, as it is. So basically we started in 2019 and the decision was made to choose um, a particular area within NHS Lothian. So NHS Lothian covers Edinburgh city and three areas that outlie the city. West Lothian lies to the west as the name suggests. And it was chosen as the area for this project because historically, West Lothian has had quite a, a high drop-off rate from breastfeeding. So it was decided that this would be the location for our project. And um, the aim of our particular project was to reduce the drop-off of breastfeeding by 2% by the health visitor's visit, which is normally sort of between day 10 and 15. So that's, that was the aim that we set ourselves. And we started the project in one area of West Lothian called Bathgate, which is a town and that has three GP surgeries. So that's where we, we started the project. And we've now expanded and we are covering seven GP surgeries, which cover three different areas in West Lothian. So Caroline and I are, are doing that at the moment. We can't probably go any further because we've probably reached the limit. But we would hope if it's to be extended that we could recruit some more staff to, to support that. But that's where we are at the moment. So the, all these projects, the government wanted them to have um, quality improvement focus. So using quality improvement methodology to implement change. And then the idea is that you evaluate the change as you go along and you continue to make small changes and evaluate um, continuously to reach your or your target. So that's what we did. We took some information from our Scottish Infant Feeding Survey that's published, and along with um, some data from families, we met with families across West Lothian and spoke to them about their breastfeeding journeys and spoke to mums about why they had stopped breastfeeding before they wanted to. And we also spoke to maternity staff and health visiting staff as well, actually. And it gave us a real wealth of information and helped us to identify a starting point for the project. So we decided that the first thing that, that we would offer would be a one-to-one -one antenatal conversation with women and their partners if they chose to attend. So that is normally offered to women around 36 weeks gestation. And it's just a, a conversation about breastfeeding. We're not talking about any other part of parent education. We're, we're focusing on breastfeeding at that conversation. And the aim of that conversation is really to build women's confidence and hopefully build their knowledge about breastfeeding 
we very much focus on the early hours and the early days after birth at the antenatal conversation. We have an emphasis on effective positioning and attachment. We talk about how to know if baby's getting enough um, and responsive parenting time really is, is the focus for that conversation. It normally takes about an hour, but obviously it, there's a variation, but on average, it's, it's been about an hour that we spend having that conversation. Obviously, that's being done virtually at the moment through a video call because we're not meeting women face to face. So that's that's what we're, we're doing for the antenatal conversation. We quite often like to talk about breastfeeding as being a new skill. That is something that you're learning that obviously if it's a first baby that, that they've never done before. And I'll often liken it to learning to ride a bike. You know, you have to practice, it takes time and you have support there, like the stabilisers on a bike. We think of our project as being a little bit like that for breastfeeding. Um, so that's kind of our antenatal conversation and, and how we talk about it. And I'm just going to show you here. This is some of the, the tools, if you like, our little toolkit that we have. And it's some of the things that we use really as visual aids to assist with the, with the conversation. And we do get some really good feedback that that helps, you know, the families to remember the things that we've talked about, that there's a visual clue there to help them. So these are here to help us talk about the microbiome. We talk about baby wearing, hormones that are involved with breastfeeding, tummy size, positioning and attachment. And we also um, share with women links and clips from our Scottish Government Parent Club website. We also share information and links to the UNICEF Baby Friendly Initiative website and global health media links, which come in different languages, which we find really useful as well. Okay, so I'm just going to play um, a little audio now, and this is really just to share with you um, some of the feedback we've had from families about the antenatal conversation. The fact that your experience and knowledge in breastfeeding has today confirmed that my thinking is correct. You have increased my confidence in my ability to breastfeed. Thanks a lot. It was a very productive and positive call, I must say. You explained things extremely well. I'm really happy with all the information you gave me. My mindset to breastfeed is even more strong now. Can't wait for baby to come so I can start my feeding journey. Thank you again for your call. It was really good to talk things through from the last experience and I feel a bit more prepared for the second time round. So that's just a little bit of the feedback from families um, when we've asked them about the antenatal conversation, how it made them feel and what they found helpful from it. So we started this and started to look at the outcomes, the breastfeeding outcomes, from the families that were offered the antenatal conversation. And we noticed that it was actually improving outcomes for breastfeeding, for continued breastfeeding, as people were as women were discharged from the hospital. So that was good. And you know, we felt that at least it was it was making some improvement. However, that wasn't a sustained improvement. And by the time we were reaching, or babies were reaching six to eight weeks, we were seeing some improvement but not as much as we would have liked. So that started us to think, what, what's going to be our next change on this quality improvement journey? What would be the next step? What can we add to our antenatal conversation that will support continued breastfeeding? And we had a plan in place, and then unfortunately COVID hit, and um, that put a bit, of, a bit of the brakes on, shall we say. So Caroline and I were both redeployed at that point back into the maternity unit. And um, that obviously put the project on hold at that point. We came back in the end of May 2020 and, and restarted the project. So at that point, we were very aware women were receiving no parent education or families, the parents, I should say, sorry, were receiving no formal um, antenatal education from NHS Lothian at that time. That had been stopped. And our breastfeeding support groups and drop-in groups were all closed as well. So we were acutely aware that actually the support for breastfeeding had been greatly reduced because of COVID. We met with our infant feeding lead, our public health lead, 
and our lead from the programme, the Scottish Government Project lead, who was supporting our project. And we all agreed that actually, rather than taking another small step and implementing a small change, we should implement the other two changes that we had um, earmarked. So at that point, we decided that that's how we would move the project forward, which meant that we would be offering an antenatal conversation along with a postnatal ward visit following the birth and then postnatal support by telephone to the families until the baby is 28 days old. And the idea of those additions of the postnatal support was to see if we could improve the continued breastfeeding rates. We were building on that conversation that we'd had antenatally with women. We were revisiting some of the topics from that conversation when we visited them in the ward. We were hoping to build their confidence and knowledge even more. Um, and we also, at the, at the ward visit, we will talk about what are the next things that might happen for you when you take your baby home. So looking at the next 24 to 40 hours and really thinking about what do women need to know at this point that will prepare them for the next couple of days in relation to breastfeeding. And again, the, the ward visit on average takes about an, an, an hour with, um, with, each, with each family. So that was the next stage. And I would just like to share with you, again, this is just some feedback from families. I'll just check my volumes. Okay. I think it's just going to play. So this is the feedback from the families about the ward I visit. I really find the ward visit very relevant and important to me. You were the only person on the postnatal ward that spent time getting baby on the breast. Some midwives on the ward were helpful, others not so helpful. I can't believe how much more informed we are this time round. We weren't told half the things you talked about today with my first baby. OK, so we've gone to see women, we've visited them in the ward and we've given them some support and then they take their baby home. And so the, the day following their discharge, we will start to offer telephone support or video calls or text messages and sometimes a combination of all of those. And that's a six day service that we offer and that continues or can continue until the baby is 28 days old. So this is a proactive service. So we actively phone women. We don't just give them a phone number and say, if you're having any issues, give us a call. We will phone them the day after discharge. And then at that, that um, chat, we'll talk about, would you like a call tomorrow? Would you like a call the next day? And we schedule in the next call. Um, this, this sort of type of, of proactive call was based on the FEST study which was carried out by Pat Hodenot and colleagues in 2012. And they were looking at reactive versus proactive telephone support um, for breastfeeding in the postnatal period. So we based it on that and we decided that the proactive support um, would be the one that would, would work the best for, for women um, and their families. So the next slide is just really to give you a little bit of insight into how that, what that support looks like. So when we look at all our women together, um, this is giving us a bit of uh, insight into how much support is needed and what days are the, 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 is the support needed more. So we've got the age of the baby running along the bottom here and the duration of calls um, in minutes. So you can see here that day four, you know, there's a, a real that's the day where there's the biggest demand, if you like, and the input is the support that we give is um, much bigger on day four. And then it gradually starts to decrease. And then we have another slight increase um, on day 12, and then again on day 17. And in the next slide, this is looking at women individually. So we've got individual women running along the, the slide at the bottom. And on our y-axis up, up um, the side, we're looking at postnatal input in hours. So this is logging all the calls that we do and the time spent on those calls. 
you can see there is a, a couple of women that have um, have required quite a significant amount of support up to six hours and just beyond six hours. But the majority require a lot less than that. But I hope that these slides can help you to see that actually any service that's offering um, additional support for breastfeeding has to be flexible and it has to be adaptable to differing needs of you know, every woman and every family will need something different. They don't all fit into the same peg, if you like, the same hole. So we try and be flexible and adaptable um, in this way to, to meet the needs of, of the women that require the service. So I'm just going to show one more little audio here. And this is just a little bit of feedback. Just check my volume, it's okay. This is just feedback about the that third part of the service, so the telephone or the calls and text support that we offer. The support you are offering is amazing. You are doing a fantastic thing here. I have used the information received from Dave's to help my sister-in-law with her breastfeeding. I couldn't have done this without this project. I have sent on to friends and family the links and information you sent me. Knowing you're there to ask has given me confidence to continue. The biological nurturing links you sent are great and have really helped during the night when baby is being fussy at the breast. Honestly, thank you so much for all your help you gave me yesterday, as I honestly think I would have stopped if I hadn't spoken to you. Just even the simple hints and tips helped massively. I feel like a different person today. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to hand over now to Caroline, who's going to share some of our actual outcomes and some of the data that we've collected. That last one always makes me feel really emotional. <laughs> we were saying today, I was like, oh, hope I don't get too emotional when I hear that one. She's just, it just really, I don't know why it does. Anyway, sorry. Um, the project is open to everybody um, that books in the antenatal period in the areas that we are working in. Um, so around 30% of the women in these areas um, are supported by the project. They are um, and they were, um, they consent basically to be part of the project. Um, and to date, when we look at all the figures, 41% of the families that are recruited um, that have had babies before, and of those, 83% have had previous breastfeeding experiences. So it just shows that it's not just mums, that the first time mums that um, are looking for support with breastfeeding. Um, and it just, I mean, it highlights basically that, you know, having breastfed before doesn't mean that you're an expert at it, and it always helps to have support. Um, Sometimes when we're doing the antenatal conversations, um, we're saying that it takes an hour roughly to do these antenatal conversations, but sometimes we're actually spending some time at just talking about previous breastfeeding experiences and supporting mums about their feelings that the, they've got from the last experience and sort of just talking about um, what to do the next, this time round sort of thing. So it does, it's not just about the, and any conversation that we have, it's a lot of the time it is talking about what's happened, what's gone before. Um, in our project as well, we also have a small supply of electric pumps. Um, and we've also noticed about a quarter of the women um, in our project have um, required the use of them. Um, and we can get them to the women quite quickly and we can support them with a feeding plan when they're using them as well. So that, I mean, that all helps with sort of the support and breastfeeding. Um, so I'd like to show, show you some of our results so far. So if you look at it, when you compare our outcomes to those of Scotland, uh, NHS Lothian as a board, and then looking at West Lothian as a locality, um, the higher percentage of sorry, Deb's babies continue to breastfeed at the first health visitor visit um, and at the six to eight week check. So it shows that providing additional um, antenatal education along with the additional support postnatally um, has a po positive impact on continuing to breastfeed. Um, this slide is thinking about basically our project aim was to reduce the drop off um, by 2% in a chosen area. So again, if you look at one area in West Lothian and then compare all those 
whose first feed was breastfeeding. Um, you see that the drop off at the first health visitor visit in Bathgate to the year prior to Bath- Deb starting um, is 47%. And then if you look at 2020, some of these women in that area have had the Deb's support. Um, the Deb service, um, and you can see that the drop off has been reduced to thirty seven percent. So, and it's likewise; it's the same with the six to eight week um, check. The drop off reduced from sixty percent in two thousand and nineteen to forty six percent in two thousand and twenty. So, all of that when put together it equates to a twenty two percent improvement at both the health visitor visit and the six to eight week um, check. There are lots of bits of information that we've been keeping in this project. <laughs> One of them is weight loss in the project. So we've been at five to six days, the babies are all weighed by the community midwives, and we know that the mums really focus on that weight as a as evidence that the babies are getting enough, whatever it is, they, they focus on that weight loss. Um, so as you can see through this chart, the majority of the babies are below 10% weight loss. Um, the few that actually have had larger weight losses, we found that you know there have been sort of reasons for these like PPH and you know, things like that. Um, basically we hope that having the additional support we can sort of reduce the number of babies that are being readmitted to hospital for weight loss. Um, admissions and hopefully increasing the mum's confidence in their breastfeeding because like I said mums do focus on this um, to know that their babies are getting enough and currently the average weight loss in our project it works out it's calculated out at 4.7 percent as a a weight loss um, in comparison to you know your average breastfeeding weight loss Um, it's slightly lower so we're always trying to ensure that um, that women families have um, access to a variety of support um, and some women you know prefer to talk on the phone others prefer to read something others prefer to go online same as the rest of us um, and as part of this we started promoting the breastfeeding network um, helpline and they've also shared with us their information that from 2000 October 2020 to November 2021, they've noticed a double in, in the amount of calls that they've had from our locality, from our postcode area. Um, it could it may be partly due to the promotion um, of the service. Women have also shared with us um, that they've gone on to support other women um, with breastfeeding just with the information that we've given them. Um, in the postnatal wards, we've had women say, talking about, you know, the, the tummy sizes and talking to other mums and explaining that the size of your baby's tummy in comparison to how much your baby's need in. And um, we've had other um, other people supporting family members um, who've just started their breastfeeding journeys. And all of that, we're hoping, contributes to building a breastfeeding community from the grassroots. Um, we're currently working with NHS Lothian Pure supporters and um, they are helping to provide the postnatal calls as well um, and we've made links with the National um, Childbirth Trust um, who are currently working in West Lothian for the first time they're running a breastfeeding support group and they're offering one-to-one support as well so all in all it's, it's going in the right direction we're getting the support out um, and we hope that by being part of the project, it's given value to women's feelings and experiences of early motherhood and breastfeeding. And we're also hoping that it's encouraging the partners to think about their role in early, in early parenthood. Um, and we hope that it supports women to achieve um, their breastfeeding, their personal breastfeeding goals, um, and also improving breastfeeding rates in our board and improving outcomes for babies and families. It's just another wee slide. That's some feedback. My knowledge in breastfeeding was much better than my friends who didn't take part in the project, and it gave me confidence that everything I was doing was right and that my baby was and still is getting enough. This is an amazing service with great support. Really helped my anxiety so much. Thank you.
the microbiome scientific part of the antenatal conversation was good. I really liked that part. It's not something that is normally discussed. There should be a midwife who only does breastfeeding. It deserves to be a job in itself. When the community midwife visits, she has so many other things to talk about. On the days she did not visit, I would not have bothered her to ask the questions I had about breastfeeding. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. That's. I know we've had we've had a couple of questions in, and. I wanted to be a sneaky question. I couldn't work out your tool bag. It looked as though you had an extension lead with little different plugs in. And I want to know what that is. You've got, you've stimulated my interest in that. So we use that, <laughs> we use that, to, to, we, we've used that in Lothian in our staff training for a number of years to talk about hormones. So we use it to talk about the pro, to think about the prolactin receptor sites and how oh. after birth there are things that you can do to help to switch them on. So a bit like putting a plug in, so things oh. like skin to skin and um, early feeds or hand expressing if the baby's sleepy. And each time we talk about one of these things, we put a plug in to say that's you now switched on the receptor sites and then they will make milk for the baby. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. OK, I've got a question from Charlotte. And for those of you watching, you want a question. Now is your chance. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. So just pop them in the, uh, the in the question box. The reason I'm looking away, uh, obviously, for people who know the show, I have another screen where the questions come in because I have to have my my people in front of me, my, all of us together. So um, Charlotte says, she's obviously, what has been the barrier to recruiting into the roles you had available? Because you said you've become a little, you were going to be a team of maybe four or five and you're a yeah. small and beautifully put together <laughs> team of two. But what, what do you think were the barriers? And do you think in the future you'd be able to get people interested? Yeah, I think um, I came on board first. And so, yeah, there was there was a... Um, member of staff who would have come on to the team as a maternity care assistant but then she was accepted into nursing so she left ah. to you know to pursue that which is fantastic mm. and there were just has been a lack of of interest in the nursery nurse or the maternity care assistant role I'm not really sure why perhaps it's because it was temporary posts you know it is a project mm. so it's only a temporary contract and maybe, you know, people don't want to leave permanent posts for temporary. Also, the, the staff that work in the hospital, you know, they'll get shift allowance pay and we don't get things like that. So these possibly are things that, that, are, that create barriers that I'm aware of. But I don't, you know, other than that, I'm not very sure. Um, okay. it's, it's, it is a shame, but yeah. But the, but the project finishes in March mm -hmm. anyway. Is it going to continue, do you think, or...? Or might, we're we keeping our fingers yeah, crossed well, for it. We've got we've got funding until June, and that's the best we know. So. Okay, we have to keep. We we'll definitely have to keep our fingers crossed then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you for that question that got us going, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Now we have Nicola Clark. Thank you, Nicola. She says, "Do you think new mothers were badly affected during COVID restrictions and missed the in-person support that was available prior?" to 2020. Caroline, do you yes. want to answer? Yeah, <laughs> they didn't have the, in our area, they didn't have the antenatal, com they didn't have the antenatal um, education at all. Initially, mm -hmm. it was just online um, education that they had and it was very basic. So yes, they did. And I know that um, some, some of the midwives in the hospital that we work in were talking about parents coming in and they weren't actually even sure how to hold babies. They didn't know mm. any of the, the basics for mm. looking after a baby, let alone breastfeeding. So, yeah, I would say they definitely okay. missed out. And they also didn't have the meeting the other mums mm. that were in the same situation. They didn't have any of that. So, yeah. 
which is a huge part of it. I mean, presumably now, and, and I would say generally, we've all got a lot better at doing online activities. Are you able to get a group together online to talk and, and have the same sort of experience as they would face to face? Has that been something you've you've done or have you been focusing on the one-to-one? For us, um, when we were doing feedback for the antenatal conversations, um, the majority of mums actually said they would prefer one-to-one so that they could ask questions. Um, They said maybe small groups. They didn't want to do large groups. Um, One-to-one was the the preferred um, choice. Um, And then postnatally in our areas, they've got the community midwives have been setting up WhatsApp groups um, for the ladies of each month. So they do have um, a way of sort of communicating with the the other ladies in their area. Um, We've not looked at, we've talked about it um, quite a bit, actually, um, most weeks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's not something that's part of our project at this point in time. So... I mean, I suppose it's a, from a from a woman's point of view, it's a bit of a treat to have that focused mm-hmm. attention on purely you mm-hmm. and how yeah. special you are. Because I think mm-hmm. sometimes that's what you can kind of lose in sometimes the group dynamics, I guess. Mm-hmm. So that's. I mean, it's definitely a luxury, and it's something that if mm-hmm. this type of project was to be scaled up, you probably couldn't maintain that. You know, you would have to look at it a different way because. It's, you know, how can you match one person with one midwife to do an hour for every lady? Mm. That's that's very, um, it's not cost effective, I guess, but perhaps small groups would be a way to do that. But yeah, it, mm. you, that personal thing, I think, is what a lot of women benefit. And particularly, as Caroline said, if they've had a traumatic or a negative experience the first time, that conversation allows them time to explore that and talk about their feelings around mm. that. And, you know, work through that a little bit which I think is quite important before they take part in their next breastfeeding journey you know to deal with it a little bit it feels like a very good investment to me yeah I I, would agree agree. (laughs) of course (laughs) of course now I'm going to move on to so thank you Nicola for that question good question um we have Joanne Leslie that hi Joanne and she says have you noticed any impact on rates of postnatal depression with this service no it's not something that we've measured is it but again it's something that we have talked about but it's not something that we've been able to measure um yeah it's got I mean that's it's it's an interesting question Joanna because I think that and it's it's almost goes back to what we were just saying about having that focused attention on that important person who's often trying to juggle everything else. I mean, we all know what women are like when they've had babies. They're suddenly trying to look after the baby, look after the house, be superwoman. And it doesn't it's not really surprising women don't do get depressed, really. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That, that, so that might be another piece of work coming. Jan, or it could be a project for you, Jan. There we are. <laughs> and Sep, hi, Sep says, um, how many months, years is a healthy time to breastfeed newborns? Well, of course, a newborn is only a period of time, but I, I wonder if you're asking about baby to children to 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 bigger infants. Did you did you want to answer that one, Sharon or? Well, certainly we, when, women, when we, women ask us that, we would sort of quote the World Health Organization, which mm. recommends to two years and beyond. Mm. But I know in this country, that's, you know, that's definitely not the norm, but that's what we would recommend and suggest to women. And that's a good, that's a good point for me to flash. This is on, this is available from the WHO. I only found out about these today and I, I'm, very delighted with them this is a little infographic and it's actually entitled many women do not breastfeed for as long as they would like and that might be because they they're having problems they're trying to balance everything else but it might be because the sort of social attitudes Mm -hmm. about breastfeeding babies longer than when they're little babies but the, the again this is on your resources list so you can have a look at some of the resources from the world health organization because they're really very good and they might be useful to you as as midwives or student midwives 
So thank you for that. So we're saying that the two years, and there is a lot of information on WHO on that. So yeah. that's a good place for homework. Um, and Kezia Kropidulowska, she says, are you thinking to recruit from BFN too, as it happens in London, for example? I'm BFN supporter, but even as a helper, I volunteered with local infant feeding teams. Um, you, you talk yeah, I think we, we again are something that we discuss a lot because we have we have NHS volunteers who are peer supporters, and we're very aware that there are other, other organisations, and certainly mm -hmm. in Scotland, those some of those organisations also were fortunate to receive funding from the government that I, I mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So they've been running projects alongside um, in relation to breastfeeding. And we're very keen that we should all dovetail and work together. Mm. Um, so that, you know, we're delighted that we've, we've sort of made links with NCT in West Lothian because it's great to then have a service that you can refer women on to. And when, when your support stops, where else can they go? You know, they, they want somewhere else. So we're delighted with that. It's a really difficult one because obviously having um, volunteers that work for NHS Lothian there's time and money and effort to recruit and to support them. And for Caroline and I, we don't have an awful lot of time personally to do that. Mm. So, you know, in a way, is it almost better to outsource these support to mm. these organisations that do it so well? But we're very passionate about our breastfeeding supporters as well. We want to, <laughs> you know, we want to keep them because look they, after them. Yeah, yeah, they get they get something out of it as well, don't they? And some mm. of them have, are are now student midwives, and that's fantastic. So it's about building capacity and building community, I think. But yeah, at the moment we've not got a, a link with EFN in West Lothian, but we certainly do in Edinburgh. So our mm. board does, but not particular to West Lothian at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you for that. OK, I've got a question from Rebecca. She says, do, do you have information on parents that give birth early that's not that has not managed to get their antenatal conversations? And have you followed any of these women? The project is um, we do. The, so we at 28 weeks, we'll ask mums at their antenatal appointment um, if they are wishing to be part of the project and um, we then book the antenatal conversation in between 34 to 36 weeks mm. so the project was to um, support women with term babies mm. so we haven't been able to do that because the project was from 37 weeks onwards mm. so no we haven't we would like to do it as well but <laughs> This sounds like another project, <laughs> but it's often with women who go into to labour early, they often have to get everything truncated and kind of condensed, don't they? Like yeah. meeting the midwife in the, in the yeah. labour ward. So it often, and, and remember, you know, the Sharon and, and Carolyn are looking at this project and this is their baby, as it were, and the feeding. But of course, it is part of our role as midwives. And student midwives to be supporting and uh, and helping women whatever their birth, their birth journey towards infant feeding so thank you that was a good question though um, and then we have Ro Rojin Maguire uh, what do you find to be the most frequent reason women stopped breastfeeding were the reasons giving surprising or in line with the research I think that might be one for Caroline I'm not sure yeah, I, I would say in line with research, to be honest with you, the majority in the early days when we were um, uh, infant feeding survey was sort of showed that it, the first couple of weeks, the main reasons were because it hurt or because they were worried that the babies weren't getting enough. Um, and that, I would say, is pretty much accurate in our project. The mums that are stopping are, or are, are mixed, going to mixed feeding, you know, are they're worried that the babies aren't getting enough or they've got problems with pain when they're feeding. Mm. Yeah. So Well, that's good. It's in line with research, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And Heather Kerr, hi Heather, says, really fantastic to see the encouraging statistics. Do you think this type of input will follow suit to other health boards? 
I think we'd like it to. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So in, as part of this being funded by Scottish Government, the idea is that we all, so there's projects all across Scotland at the moment, mm. actually, or some of them are finished now. But the idea was that we would all come back together and share our findings. And of course, COVID has made that a little bit difficult. Mm. And it's, it was meant to happen um, at the end of last year and has been put on hold. So the plan now is, in March this year, we all the projects will share their findings, and the hope is that the government then, you know, I don't know, pick the ones that have the best results and look at how these things mm. can be spread more widely. It has to be funded, you know, there has to be mm. a commitment somewhere. I don't know if that's to come from the government or the health boards, but yeah, it would. We would love to um, certainly look at how we can scope this out, even just. Mm you know initially across Lothian and, and looking at other areas that high, have high drop-offs mm. and if we then brought the project to those areas can we have the, the same impact so that that would be our, probably our next step locally but equally it, it's on the radar for the whole of this of, of Scotland to look at um, mm. because of the stretching they have for 2025. Mm. I mean the, be the benefit is of, for this sort of presentation is that you could you could actually as midwives the audience here i'm talking to really could take parts of the project i.e I, this sort of idea of a, a really concentrated time when you can talk yeah. infant feeding to the mother we give so much information to the to women but there is a a place for that so this is a sort of way of thinking about it mm -hmm. now i've got uh joe d'agustin hi joe says great presentation yes she's right thank you and great results how lucky are the service users in your area thank you wonderful to see how your data you're collecting and how you are supporting an understanding of physiology amongst mums fantastic i've one concern is it possible to compare this project with one in in which such breastfeeding support is embedded in a continuity of care model of care given that's the model that's, um, well, it's it's going UK-wide, isn't it, the continuity model? We've all got different country strategies with that same kind of uh, philosophy underpinning. What do you think? Is that a Sharon question? You can have that one, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are currently one of, the, when I, we work in three areas, and one of our areas has become a best start area so the best start is the model that we're um, rolling out in Scotland for that continuity of care so we're working alongside those best start midwives with the idea being that you know we at the moment we're giving that one-to-one -one antenatal conversation but I think the hope is that it would be looking at how can that conversation be taken over by that best start midwife and can she then deliver you know, a similar model to us mm. with the capacity that they have. So that's something that we've started doing in one of our areas. So yeah, watch this space, I guess. I might, I think oh. we, at the moment, this, the sort of initial feedback from the midwives is they didn't see how they could give that whole hour antenatally mm. to each woman, but they are very new in that model so it's going to maybe take them a you know a couple of months just to find their own feet in this new way mm. of working mm. and then we can maybe revisit again how they would be able to um fit that that antenatal converse that really good antenatal conversation into their to their care care package and they, have well. take, they have taken in a uh, um consideration the postnatal sort of evidence that we gave them for the telephone support mm. um, yeah. and and started to um the mums that were breastfeeding in the project, not in the project, sorry, the mums that were breastfeeding in that area and actually phoning them a little bit more frequently than what they had been doing um, before because we could tell them that um, on these days, this is when the mums are sort of needing a little bit more um, support. Oh, yeah. From the little block pictures. Yeah, that we had. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Really good. Thank you very much. That's fantastically answered. Lovely. OK, we've got Nora uh, Vallejo. Vallejo. Not sure if my pronoun sounds Spanish. Um, hi, Nora. 
She says, are postnatal workloads for midwives negatively impacting breastfeeding support? Or is it that midwives are losing confidence in supporting women? That's a very good question, Nora. Very good question. And I'm not sure what the answer is, actually. And I'm oh. not sure if it would be fair to, to make Sharon or Caroline answer that one. Do you have uh, any views on that? It's Personally, on the surface, I think it's time. I don't think it's that they don't, that midwives don't mm. have the skills because, mm. you know, I, I haven't particularly done a huge amount of more infant feeding training than any other midwife, but I think it's time. You got the focus uh, It's time. my personal opinion, but if there's any community midwives out there that beg to differ, if that's, you know, but from my perspective, I think it's <laughs> well, if they time. Beg if they beg to differ they're going to have to get a move on because we're running on time here okay and um someone is uh, monique rabowski lactation consultant shell banks has written a book about formula feeding called why formula feeding matters she found it important to write this book because all information about formula comes from formula companies oh it launches tomorrow and should be a good read i i don't know this person but um so that's just some information for our audience there. And then we have Sharon Gowen says, do you find there are certain types of resources that may help mums who may be struggling to maintain breastfeeding more than others? For example, leaflets, one-to-one -one group meetings. Go on, Caroline. I was going to say, I really find the Global Health Media links really, really useful for mums. I think that's my go-to when, like, if I've got a mum that I'm speaking to that's really struggling because they can visually see the position and attachment. They can, and it's in lots of different languages as well. So it, it's it got everything in it. If they've got, you know, position and attachment, sore breasts, sore nipples, if they want to increase their milk supply, it's got information about if you've got small babies um, that you're feeding, it's, it's got so much information in there that it, it, pretty much everything's in there. So that's that's the go-to that's fantastic my, that's my go-to <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good go-to to me yeah um and nicola clark says our words create worlds to reduce the possible guilt concept with giving up could we suggest our terminology and suggest mothers have breastfeeding cross days weeks and then change their method of feeding not give up yeah, I think it's there is an mm -hmm. issue about um, giving up. Yeah, and I think if if anyone's read any work by any Brown, they'll know it's it's quite a big thing for mm -hmm. women, especially if they've that's what they've planned and they haven't had that support to kind yeah. of continue feeding. And I think, do you know, we only have a one minute to go, so I think I have to just say. A huge, huge thank you first to the audience for coming along and asking some very good questions, some of them tricky and some of them easier to answer than others. And thank you so much to Sharon and Caroline, who've been fantastic and given us a flavour. I know on this project there is masses and masses more data, so I shall promise that we're, we're going to twist Sharon and Caroline's arms to come again, uh, maybe after June would be a good time because they're going to be busy i'm sure writing up reports and things because there's always great big reports when there's projects going and so we'll we will invite them later on because there, there's a lot about this project that's really exciting and that we can take as midwives so thank you so much for your time and your expertise it's been fantastic